Hello, it's Hebby, and welcome to a new video. Do not check the upload date when watching, it's not relevant at all. But first of all, to satisfy all of you, I'm moving Blue up a layer to sit with Cricket, who was made in the last video. So far in this challenge, we've gotten through Albatross, Anemone, Orklet, Arctic, Blister, Blaze, Burn, Battle Winner, Blue, Chameleon, Coral, Clear Sight, Clay, and, you know, the one I just showed, Cricket. Here's a lightning fast update on the special extra round characters who I will be making when we come up to a letter where I'm not doing any characters or I'm only doing one character. Also, happy Easter! I got a whole bag of weird chocolates from the Aldi discount bin. Hmm. This one is a human man inside the wrapper. Oh, but this one is a bunny. That's real surprise value. Anyways, on with this video. Time for my absolute favourite character in all of Wings of Fire. I'm making all the dragons, and my plushy challenge would be remiss without this shining beacon of a character. Well, Paul. Most beloved and precious of Sea Wings, he deserves a beautiful green colour palette, not at all reminiscent of sea slime, industrial effluent, or walrus armpit grease. Whirlpool has an extra short and slightly lumpy back frill, which is both attractive and totally in fashion. We are sewing down the veins up to each individual point. There's quite a lot of these per sea wing. Now I'm mixing up some gorgeous slightly greenish black fabric paint and smearing that artistically up the lines of his frill. Beautiful. Once again, totally in fashion this season in the sea wing kingdom. Time to sandwich that between his spine pieces. Have I mentioned this is my Favourite colour of green? This is a real gourmet sandwich. Once that's done, it's time to add the body side pieces, which is definitely my second favourite colour of green and reminds me in no way of blowing your nose when you're sick. That's so lovely. And now for the chest colour, which is actually not so bad, although it is kind of confused between being green and being yellow but that's fine by me. Now that's done and the seam allowance is snipped off, we can turn him right side out, being extra careful with this one because he is extra special. Ignore what I'm doing with these magnets, by the way. It won't be relevant in the future, but if you yourself want to find them, as in the magnets to buy, you can look up sewable magnets and find them online. Anyways, now he needs to be stuffed and beamed. Looking gorgeous already. Time to create Whirlpool's head, where he keeps his brains. Very smart and clever and awesome brains. Now to make his facial features, including those alluring curved horns. Also, I don't know if you can see the sky in the background, but it's just a gorgeous day. The sun is shining. How perfect for this activity. Time to create his stunningly good-looking face with all the parts we have just sewn up, including his horns, which are sort of weirdly, I mean, interestingly thin in the graphic novel. I'm not sure why that is. Must just be another one of those superior genetic traits that Whirlpool is blessed with congenitally. And we need to pierce his ears. This is the fourth dragon with ear piercings so far, but all the rest have been silver. Gold is clearly much more fashionable. Now to do his eyes, which are described as blobby. I don't know what that means. Maybe blobs of beautiful emeralds? That's what Tsunami meant, I'm sure of it. Finishing up his handsome face, we need his extremely luscious and not at all shrimpy and evil goatee-esque barbels. Time to add his head to his body. Take that back, actually. I'm going to add an additional magnet to Whirlpool's neck which won't at all be important later and you should just ignore it and block it out. And then I'm going to sew his head down. Awesome. He totally needs that and I didn't want to leave it off at all. Also, I'm going to add some eyelids to Whirlpool. These slightly fluffy bits are hard to control. Now to make his wings, by the way, if you ever choose to put pipe cleaners or wire into them in order to make them poseable, which I don't do because plushies are better soft in my opinion, but you should curl the end of your wire over when inserting it into the wing vein, 
because if you don't blunt the end and curl it, then it will punch through your stitches and probably wind up sticking out and stabbing you. So you know, that's your useful piece of advice for this video. Oh, other than this, because I'm making his legs now, which I got backwards and messed up when I was cutting them out, but managed to salvage it. And that would have been bad because I don't have much of this fabric. Some of the fur direction is a bit wrong, but ignore that. I had to hastily fix it, and I was literally left with a single ribbon of this fabric. Anyways, a lot of people have asked me how much fabric they'll need to make one of these patterns. And it's super variable, because even discounting messing it up sometimes and having to recut the pieces. Tracing all the parts to minimize waste fabric is a skill in and of itself. But I use about half a meter by half a meter, or more, for the main body color. And if you're making double-sized dragons, keep in mind that the long pieces, like the frill or back parts, are longer than 50 centimeters when laid flat. Anyways, I'm not even sure what to say about Whirlpool's evilness score, because he's just so good. He did try to kill Tsunami in unexpected blindfolded combat, which is definitely a reasonable move there, and also totally a fair fight and not a cowardly thing to do at all. And then of course there's the marriage thing. Oh my god, he just keeps going lower, starts with Tsunami and just keeps making it worse. Um, let's just not even talk about the whole marriage thing. And Whirlpool's breath, smelling like fish sticks and unbrushed teeth, is definitely a crime. And, and a crime of... Who needs toothbrushes anyway? That's totally fine too. And his oily voice. Mm, that's awesome as well. He should start an ASMR channel. That would be just lovely and not at all horrible. Anyways... Let's not give Whirlpool a score right now because I might have to invent a greatness scale for him specifically. That's how great and amazing he is. So I can't talk about that yet. Also, I tried to position him with his chest sticking out like he was strutting around. And then I'm adding his toes. He actually has claws that have been stained black from ink. So does Coral, but I thought it would look a bit strange on her in plush form. But if it looks strange on Whirlpool then that's not my problem. He's already just... I mean, it really accentuates his gorgeous green complexion, so it's a positive, frankly. And since he invented the stuff, he deserves to wear it. So I'm going to mix up some watered-down black paint and dip him into it until his front feet are stained. I'm also going to do his glow scales, because both of these will take a while to dry in the cold, wet weather. And also, he needs these to teach Tsunami Aquatic. He is a charming and very good teacher, after all, and wouldn't dare teach Tsunami all those inappropriate dragon swears, like a certain other dragon of lower-born blood would. Anyways, once that's all dry, it means he's completely finished. My favourite sea wing, scratch that, my favourite character ever! Isn't that just... lovely? Are you happy now? Evil Hebby. Well, really, only one of us can be the evil version, so that's probably you. But if you ever want to see your family again, you... Happy 1st of April, you idiot nerds. It's time to use and abuse this miserable plushie before the final step and course correct of this making video. He's sufficiently punished for now. What Whirlpool really needs is a fetching scarf. You might not know this about me, but eels are my natural enemy. You'd be surprised how close you might be to an eel at any time. In fact, they're in the subterranean drains around my house, which I love to enter at night because if that clown wants to fight, he's going to be faced with a clown of equal proportions to him if you know what I'm saying. 
Of course, you know what I'm saying. Look at you, you're so very smart. Look at it getting Whoa. away. The boss. Where are you going, sir? Into the drain hole. Where are we going? <laughs> It's like I'm cleaning the tunnel with my hair. What are you looking at? Eel. Boom. Right there. I knew oh, it. Yes. I hope you enjoyed my unidentified swimming object eel footage. Anyways, I have drawn some inspiration from the slimy beasts that live among us. Among us. Anyways. You might be tempted to say that the eels who killed Whirlpool are electric eels, but electric eels are not found in salt water, and they're not even that closely related to other eels in the taxonomic sense. Anyways, to fix that issue, I have simply created a new form of eel. It does, of course, need to be electric, so I hit up the local electronics store for some of this mad scientist pocket lint. The workers at J Carr have to put up with a lot of harebrained schemes. And if there were mad scientists, supervillains in the general populace, they would be hitting up that joint. I will explain what I essentially want to accomplish as I go. It's time to test the idea, though. The first issue was simply getting this switch to work. These essentially complete a circuit in the presence of a magnet, so that's why the resistance measured with the multimeter reads infinite and then a number as the circuit completes itself. Second issue was running an LED through this thing that would flash. The reed switches are finicky and evil, just so you know. Had to get my dad to mangle an Allen key so I could get the reed switch to stick to a magnet, since it can't be magnetic itself. The switch would be on all the time. Not all metals are magnetic, and not all things that are magnetic are magnets. You don't technically need to sacrifice an Allen key to the Dark Gods to get this to work. You can use any ferrous metal. I'm turning to some good old structural hot glue for this project to keep the reed switch in contact with a metal to help guide it to the magnet point. Anyways, time to continue on my amateur circuitry creation journey. I'm breaking out the soldering iron for round two in the ring with it, just in case I have any fingerprints left from making Battle Winner. Gotta make sure to burn those off. And it's time to wire the reed switch to the battery and then from the switch to one of the LEDs, because we're going to be using three. But between the next two, we put something extra. This little wee is a capacitor. Since lightning or thunder flashes erratically, to try to replicate that effect, we'll need some of these wired in line here alongside the LEDs. The capacitor basically stores and discharges energy. Some sort of small capacitor is also present in the diodes themselves, which makes them flash, I presume? So using this capacitor should rapidly desynchronize the flashing of the LEDs and make it appear like they're random, like lightning. You can see the smoke coming off the soldering iron. Solder has lead in it, so not great for your health? But my uncle has a master's in electronics and he's not dead yet from lead poisoning, so great news. Okay, time for a test. They all flash, and they do indeed desynchronize between themselves after a few cycles of light. Awesome. Now, to make the eel element. Like Battle Winner, the LED diodes have to go inside of the plush, which is a little bit hard since they're going to be covered with fabric, and it's kind of hard to know how they'll look until it's done. The problem with LEDs is that they shine best through the same color family of fabric which disperses the light better. So even though most eels I'm looking at are dark colors, browns, and olives and yellows, it's inadvisable to use these colors with blue LEDs because the light will look very localized and therefore very weak. So for my first attempt, in hindsight a bad attempt, I'm making this eel here. The eels in the story are already pretty big, to be honest, but it has to be extra thick to fit all the wires and stuff inside. I sewed it up, it's this insipid blue-green colour, and it came out bad. The wires barely even fit, so I'll chalk this one up to a failure of concept and try for a second design with a better idea. But whilst we're changing stuff, 
I'm going to replace the blue LEDs with yellow ones and go for my drain eel coloration, which I was initially sad I couldn't do because of the light thing. I went back to the electronics store and got new blinky lights. This won't be too difficult, but it does give the soldering iron another chance to bite me. Unfortunately, I shrink wrapped my wires, and you should too. But it means, in the event of a mistake, I have to cut this off, which is just fiddly, and I'm scared for my fingertips. Now I can melt the solder, holding the blue LEDs in with the wires, and pull them out whilst it's still molten hot for all six of the attachment points. Without burning myself! Tally that is another win for me! And now to actually replace our diodes. They need new shrink plastic also to protect the join. Also, the wires are sharp, and they actually kind of ouch my hand. Like tiny needle tips. Anyways, the yellow LEDs have a different voltage requirement for optimal brightness, so I can actually use rechargeable batteries. Unlike the blue variety, which are extremely dull with rechargeables. Now it's time to recreate the eel part of this. I'm really surprised that this time I wasn't mauled brutally by the soldering iron. I actually escaped its grasp. It's very hot, if you can't tell, and glue guns are already my mortal enemy. Besides eels, of course, which are my natural enemy. It's different. Mostly because they're just so slimy, it's impossible to catch one. They're like one of those water wiggle toys that slip out of your hand, but covered in pure olive oil and given a strategic home turf advantage against you. And they can bite. Just for your own curiosity, not all eels have a second jaw in the throat that can take your fingers off if you touch one. That is just moray eels. And they're found in the ocean. And these ones in my videos are long-finned and short-finned eels that can go from salt water to estuarine to fresh water. It will still hurt, though, if you get bitten by one. They might be my enemy any other day, but you know what they say about the enemy of my enemy. They make great projectile weapons to launch at the guy who was your first enemy. Now he's actually all finished, with his eel friend. Well, friend might be a stretch because of this next thing, because not only does he glow in the dark, I didn't charge his scales that much, but I swear he does. When the eel bites him, it activates the electricity effect. Isn't that just lovely? I'm giving him a 10 out of 10 for evil because I just hate him and want him to suffer. Even though his villainous schemes are dumb, and he doesn't even successfully pull off even one of them. Seriously, he's basically useless and then is eaten by elongated aquatic animals. I don't think there's any whirlpool enjoyers out there to defend him against this evil score, so I can say whatever I want. Oops, bit him a little bit hard there, won't come off. He can also be bitten anywhere the magnets are, including the butt. I'm not that sorry for making it a feature. He's probably not overly impressed by this arrangement, though. Alright, now I've done it. Get off this page. And you'll have to wait for the next one. I was supposed to make another video before this, but I got dragged off on a research trip with my ecology class. Anyways, get out of here. Just kidding. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to annihilate that like button and... Oh my god, he's back! Thank you to my patrons. Kimba, Cool Cloud, ADH Dream 1409, Kid and Mikey, Haps, Samuel Sanchez, Maisie Peach, Lisa Aguado, Mono Deer, Aninka Lemason, Grey, Solvai, Phoenix Fire, I Like the Dumb Bunny Shrimp, Fennec is Here, Trooper Cat, Poppy Willow, Inky Boy YT, Indigo, and Woilies.